I, I think the Lord calls everybody, but, but I think not everybody chooses to answer. I, I thought many times when I was a child that I was just so desperate for God to pick me. And I felt that way. Like I just went after him uh, like a kid trying to get a teacher's attention in elementary school. That's what it felt like to me. I never knew, never knew until I was well into adulthood that really he was pursuing me, not the other way around. That revolutionized my thinking. Welcome, everyone. Today, we are so blessed to be joined by Dr. Janice Joshran. She is a wonderful musician and singer, as well as an effective communicator of the gospel. She and her husband pastor Christian Apostolic Church in Newark, Ohio. And if that wasn't enough, she also has a doctorate in education. We had a great conversation about her amazing life and ministry. She shared her wisdom for those of us who are involved in the day-to-day operations of the church, the story behind how she wrote the alabaster box, the difference between being anointed and being used by God, and much more. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you for joining us today, Sister Sosheran. My pleasure. I always have looked up to you and your husband, and, and it was a blessing to have him on a few months ago on the podcast. And uh, I'm so glad that that you uh, decided to join us as well. You're a wonderful woman of God, someone we look up to, and has has been such a blessing to my my family and my wife and I in particular. So so grateful to have you on and to share a bit of your story here on the podcast. Thank you. I'm delighted for the opportunity, and um, I was delighted that my husband had an opportunity to share. Everybody has a story, so yes. it's nice to tell yours when your turn comes. Yes, that's right. Well, and, and speaking of which, I like to start out these conversations by uh, our uh, audience getting to know the guests a little bit. Some may know you, some may not, but if you wouldn't mind sharing a little bit of your background, uh, just so we get a, a, a bit of an idea of your worldview, that sort of thing. Thank you. Okay. Well, my parents were both raised in uh, the Mid-South in the state of Arkansas. Uh, Actually, my father's family uh, migrated to California um, when my dad was six. My father is now 87. So right after the Great Depression in the United States, my, my father's family moved to California And my mother's family, they didn't know one another. They remained in Arkansas where she grew up with her other 10 siblings. Um, Mm. And my my mother was not raised in church, but she got the Holy Ghost in a tent revival. And my dad got the Holy Ghost in Southern California in a prayer meeting. Uh, People just found God in all kinds of ways. um, Mm. Because as you know, the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was, was recent. And mm-hmm. so my dad was 17 and they had a family prayer meeting, about a hundred people gathered in someone's house and, and he received the Holy ghost there. And my parents then met in California. My mother moved to be with her sisters, uh, to get a job in one of the factories. I think it was, um, post world war II. there was a lot of factory work. And so my parents met because of church. Um, his first cousin had married my my mother's sister. So that's where they met. And I was born then subsequently in California. And I'm telling you that background because um, a Southern background, uh, actually a lot of people that were living in California at that time had immigrated from the South because of the Great Depression. They had moved to California for work. So Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in a little home missions church in Bellflower, California. Of course, I didn't know it was home missions. It was the only church I knew. My mom and dad dedicated me as a baby. And I had a very, very strong apostolic background because once my parents got in church, I mean, they were all in. And Mm. we went to church three times a week. 
And uh, it's when services were rather lengthy. It was nothing for us to start at seven and and get out at 11 o'clock. And my mom and dad brought pajamas and and changed us. (laughs) (laughs) And we fell asleep in the car on the way home every Sunday. So it was it was pretty wonderful. There was a lot of passion. I remember a lot of loud, fiery services on that little wooden floor and um, just some great experiences. So my my background was forged in apostolic fire. It really was. That's awesome. And so ultimately, you ended up meeting your husband. Uh, did, did you all meet in California? Did you meet in Arkansas? We actually met in Arkansas because when I was 17, my mom and dad moved back to Arkansas. Uh, My father started working for himself in construction, started his own company. And that was 1976, the year I was supposed to graduate from high school. And I met um, my husband, who was a year ahead of me. I met him that year. And then I think we had our first official date. Uh, December the 23rd, 1976. Yes. Oh, wow. And then six months later, we were engaged June the 23rd, 1977, and then married November 4th, 1977. So it was pretty quick courtship. (laughs) Yeah. Merry Christmas to Brother Joe Stern, right? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I hope. (laughs) It worked out pretty well. (laughs) So, so you grew up in, in the apostolic church. W- was, were you always in and around ministry, involved in ministry, your family, yes. you know, because I, it's I, a whole missions work? Yeah. My entry point was music because everybody in my family, uh, my uncle played a stand up bass. My mother and father both played the guitar. Uh, both of my aunts, I had three aunts at that time in the same church. Uh, one played the piano, the other played the organ. Um, and so it was very natural that I would start singing at four years old, which I did. Oh, wow. uh, of course, you have to understand that back in the day, church was pretty raw. It was mm. um, not performance oriented. People were volunteers. And if you could play, you played and you played with all your might. So I was interested early on in playing something. And so I begged my parents for an accordion and they got me a little used accordion, which oh, I still wow. have to this day. And I started learning to play it at the age of eight. So um, our lives revolved around church. So there wasn't a whole lot of time. There, there, there weren't as many distractions as people have now. It was church mm-hmm. three times a week and then uh, no television, no media to compete with um, we listened to records or, and those are those round discs that you actually <laughs> play with a needle, yeah. you know? Uh, and so, um, we had, I had a very insular loving childhood that revolved around family and church. And then when I got bored, I play my accordion. It was like, a mm. it was like a big Rubik's cube to me and I was trying to figure it out. So it, it was, it was a good thing we didn't have television. Let me put it to you like that. Because <laughs> yeah. cause I learned to play an instrument. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah it'll be interesting to see, like, um, you know, these generations coming up now. Because even my generation, we still had a lot of that. Especially if you grew up UPC, you know, you, you didn't right. really have a lot of those distractions. I didn't, no. I wasn't, I didn't grow up on a TV or anything like that. I read. Um, yes. You know, had, my free time was used up in, in other ways. But yeah, it'll be interesting to see the results of that. I think I learned to write because I read so much. I, Mm. I, I think I just absorbed, uh, the rules of grammar and good writing. I was always good at it, but I read everything I could get my hands on. Mm. So, um, and I think that probably only helped me in my future calling as an educator and, and then otherwise, you know. Mm. So uh, you started off in the home missions work and uh, the music ministry, that sort of thing, you accordion, and then ultimately you ended up playing the piano, which is what you're probably most famous for, playing piano and singing. Um, how, how long have you been serving in ministry and to what capacity? Just to give uh, the listener a bit right, of an idea. Right. 
Well, because churches were so desperate for musicians of any kind, um, I started playing in church very young for a brief three-year hiatus. We had moved to Arkansas from 1967 to 70, during which time uh, in 1967, I got the Holy Ghost at the age of nine mm-hmm. years old. And I started playing my little accordion in that church. There was a place for people to play a little band area on the floor. It was an elevated platform. And so everybody else that wasn't on the platform, you know, they had a very neat little situation and I was watching an older lady play. And so, and then I quickly, quickly learned, uh, I, I could hear quicker than I could read music. So I just came mm. kind of gave up on that and went with my ear. And when we returned to California, um, I was 12 years old and I started playing the piano and the Hammond B3 in church. I just, Mm. they needed somebody and, and, and I could do it and was just elated to do it because I was just learning as fast as I could. And I had a lot of black gospel influence uh, in Southern California at that time. It was just phenomenal. There, There were so many artists that were leaving the Southern gospel kind of flavor, you know, and, and Mm -hmm. so many black artists, Walter and Edwin Hawkins and Andre Crouch and James Cleveland and Shirley Caesar, all of these people were hugely influential on the gospel scene and changed the sound of praise and worship. And I suppose that that probably was equivalent to some of the more guitar driven things that we have today, at least generationally, you know, because Mm -hmm. then it was, an organ with a Leslie and drums and a bass. And there was just a sound in the seventies that was so phenomenal and passionate and wow. So um, that started me and I was teaching Sunday school. Uh, I had a little Sunday school class when I was 16. My father led the choir and my family was always involved in something in church. So it was just natural that I was too. I don't think I looked at it as ministry. We didn't use that terminology. It's just that I was asked to serve and I was honored to, whether it was direct a choir or sing in a choir. And then um, when we moved back to Arkansas in my senior year, um, I played at the churches that I went to then. And um, I did anything that I could. It typically wound up being music, directing a choir, and playing, you know, and then I, I discovered that I, I wanted to flow in worship versus, Mm. um, I think that was one of the most powerful changes in my life because when my husband and I married, we were 19 and 20, his mother and father were pastoring in Arkansas where we settled. And, um, I began not leading the worship per se, but playing for the people that did lead the worship. And then before long, um, I don't remember exactly when it happened, but at some point I started leading with the chorale and we just started going from one song to the next in a flow Mm. that was unbroken. And it was, it was amazing because typically because of the format of church services then, The worship was broken by necessary things, announcements, offerings. But I think under my husband's tutelage with his father, we, our worship evolved into like an unbroken. And it was like songs would suggest themselves to me. Now, this is where things, you know, um, are a little different because I would just flow from one song to the next and make key changes, chord progressions, and just expect that my group would follow with me. They worked with me long enough that we did that. We just did it from one song to the next. And um, the Lord really opened some powerful doors for us during that time. Um, While I was in Arkansas, I became a a high school teacher of Spanish and English. 
And then God just began opening door after door after door after door. And a lot of it began with music. One of the first things I ever did when we got married was to sing at a community Thanksgiving service. And I'll never forget, I sang an Andre Crouch number, Thank You, Lord, uh, playing the um, pipe organ for the United Methodist Church. (laughs) That's where they had to be rotated. (laughs) So that was my first foray into that community and it was like from then on um, I sang at all kinds of meetings everything boy scouts girl scouts eastern star Um, I did all kinds of things and each one God was just opening one door after another always word of mouth until finally some of those events I I got a a stent actually, because I opened for um, a radio station, um, some of the black churches. I I went all over Arkansas singing in in different African-American churches and the Holy Ghost would just move. I was, and I was in my element because it Mm -hmm. it was part of my background. So I just loved it. And I would take our corral and we would go. And um, at one, one event in the community, one of the community community leaders who who was African-American who heard me sing said, we're opening a radio station. A man from Detroit is coming. We want to have a big opening. Will you do it? And I did. And then they offered me a job as a DJ for a gospel. (laughs) Jan Sostrand, KWTD FM on your radio dial 106. Well, again, good morning. Yes. (laughs) And so I spun records for, five hours a day for about six months until I got a job teaching high school. But what is amazing is from that inauspicious beginning, when the NAACP asked Ray Charles to come and do a benefit concert for them, they called me to audition to open for him. And I, we were pastoring a little home missions church uh, in Little Rock. We were commuting back and forth and That's where they auditioned me in this little clapboard building with a little upright piano. And um, I sang and it was um, a PR firm that was representing Mr. Charles. And they auditioned me and said, you're hired. And so uh, I opened for him for exactly six hundred dollars. I think he was (laughs) five hundred five fifty thousand. And he wanted another 50 to sing America the Beautiful. I kid you not. And so they came to me about five minutes before I was scheduled to go on. And the man that auditioned me said, "Uh, they would like to hear America the Beautiful and Mr. Charles won't sing it. Would you, could you possibly sing that? I said, oh yeah. Never knowing that was his signature song. (laughs) I just walked out, sat at the Steinway Grand, you know, ignorance is bliss. Yeah. And. Uh, because I was blissfully ignorant, I thought nothing. Of course, I can sing America the Beautiful. And so I walked out. And what I didn't know is in that audience were two people whose intersection with my life. One was the former governor of Arkansas. And the other was a friend of the current governor, um, Bill Clinton. And wow. from then on, for a period of time, um, I sang... With our corral, he would ask us to come and do, only in the South can you do this. (laughs) Uh, It was like rallies, political rallies, Mm -hmm. and we would do all kinds of inspirational, patriotic music. And um, in the South, that's not unheard of uh, because people are, they at that time were churched or Christians. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, I mean, God, mom, apple pie, whether you're Democrat or Republican, God, mom, apple pie. And so that opened so yep. many doors. Back then, so, the mor- back then, the moral divide wasn't as extreme as it is now no, between those no, parties. Yeah. Not at all. And so, um, and, so, and uh, we were very apolitical because we were mm-hmm. not, and... To be fair, Governor, then Governor Clinton did not ask us because we were Democratic supporters. I'd also sung for events for the Republican Party because word of mouth, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so God opened so many doors. And of course, during that time as a high school teacher, I became a motivational speaker for many of the Red Ribbon uh, drug education weeks. And I would bring a keyboard and I would sing current songs that the kids knew that were uplifting. And then I'd give them my little spiel, a three point whatever. And, uh, you know, I went north, south, east and west in the state of Arkansas. I always felt like um, one of the popular folk heroes in the United States is a man called Johnny Appleseed who mm-hmm. went from place to place planting trees and proclaiming Jesus. And I always felt like I was Janice Appleseed. <laughs> 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 it was just uh, going from one place to the next. I, and I think what was so incredible is um, even though I, I did not quote scripture, I was speaking a truth that many of the people who were Christians understood as being Bible based. Mm -hmm. And I can remember so many times feeling the presence of God and having children come up and and cry and thank me for the words of encouragement. Of course, I knew they were Bible based and I knew what they were feeling. Um, And God was just good. And then, of course, that opened doors. Um, And I went to many denominal churches because I had sung then the uh, governor elect Clinton asked me to sing for both of his inaugural gubernatorial prayer services. And then the night of his election, um, he asked that I would lead a Philander Smith choir, which is um, an African-American school and mm-hmm. we combined with our group. And on the night of November the 4th, uh, would have been 1991 when he won the first election, we were there. And, wow. um, you know, uh, I that was guess, for the presidency, right? That, that that's election? right. That's right. Yeah, not, so not I sang for that. That was the night of the election. And then he asked uh, me to come with my group and sing at both of his inaugural prayer services. Um, and, and I guess what I want you to hear me say, these are stories I'm connecting over a period of time. But the truth is, although they may have had their agenda, God had his. Mm-hmm. And it was remarkable to be a part of history, largely unnoticed by historical figures but put there by the hand of God. That was so amazing to me because the Bible, although the Bible is very direct in placing the word of God in context with the people about which those stories are on the larger scale, he said, you're not going to be numbered among the nations. Mm -hmm. There was so much going on in Egypt while Moses was in the wilderness, you know, he wasn't even a backstory, but God had a plan, always his people flying under the radar and always present because against the backdrop of great sweeping historical events, God is calling out a people and it never was made more apparent to me than during those years of the nineties, while we were present in the midst of great and sweeping events Mm -hmm. where we were not the main event and yet we were there as a witness to history. And I think one, one moment that really spoke to me that was so poignant. And if you knew my, my story, um, brother Greg, as a worshiper that, that I was so passionate about God from the time I was a little kid, I, um, his presence meant so much to me. I'd go up mm. every Sunday. They'd have a prayer line. You'd have to tell what was wrong with you. And I lied every Sunday. I have a headache because I, <laughs> I didn't have a headache. I just want them to pray for me because pray. I could feel something. Mm. And it was so profound. And we had watch night services. Um, that's when you stay up um, and, and pray the new year in. And the women have foot washing. And I remember my little Hispanic Sunday school teacher kneeling on her knees and taking my little foot and washing my feet. You don't forget stuff like that. Yeah. So I always feel like worship, worship, 
the reality of God was so profound to me. And when we were at the state capitol in Arkansas, the night that um, President Clinton, President-elect Clinton was actually elected and, and received um, enough votes and, and they had done the countdown. I had told our group, you're not gonna be noticed but your voices are going to go around the world. People are going to hear you sing. And the irony of it is I, we sang a song that I wrote when I was 16 in high school wow. together. We can climb any mountain. I did it for a class project. <laughs> and, and, and when I was teaching high school, I taught it to a bunch of seniors um, as a class day performance. You see, God always took one little thing I did to take me to the next little thing that I did. Mm -hmm. I've just been doing little things all my life. Yeah. And that to me is ministry. Being asked, wherever you're asked to serve, you just do it. And if God uses it to open it, uh, the next door, I mean, that's always the way my life has been. Every step ordered. And during that time I was teaching high school, we had a German exchange student named Julia. And uh, she was there in my Spanish classes for a term. Then she went back to Germany. And I got a letter from her after the November election. Uh, Dear Mrs. Schostrand, I cannot tell you how amazed I was. All my friends came to watch the night of the election in my house in, I don't know if it was Wiesbaden or Berlin or wherever. And I was in the kitchen getting some snacks and I heard this voice come across the television. And I ran in yelling, that is my Spanish teacher. That is my Spanish <laughs> teacher. And um, it was so amazing to me because against the backdrop of all these national journalists for national news agencies, big names from CNN and all the other news outlets that were there. And I saw people that I had seen on television, news reporters, and there they were. It was one little German student that had come through the doors of my classroom in Lone Oak, Arkansas, population 4,328 in the year wow. 1991, who was a witness. That's the backstory, the undercurrent that God does. And so uh, from that moment on, I think, and many others that followed, um, our little group was asked to sing at both prayer services. And in between the first and second inauguration, when President Clinton's mother died, he called the high school where I was working. An aide asked for me and then he got on the phone and he said, I want you to work the crowd. And I knew what he meant. He, he, he said, I don't want this to be sad. He was mm. very close to his mother. I want you to work the crowd. He wanted to feel the presence of God. And the only way to do that is not to perform, but to worship. Yeah. And when you start worshiping and people see your sincerity and you're not ashamed to show that you love, and, and it makes you vulnerable because they're observing the passion on your face. They're, mm. you know, they're observing you. They're not doing it. You are. Yeah, that's right. But, but they're feeling through you. And um, he asked for holy ground. And uh, for one hour before he arrived, he, he gave me one day's notice. He called on a Friday and his mother's funeral was on a Saturday. I was like, Dear God. <laughs> so you know what we did, Brother Greg? We did what we always did. I said, I'm going to go from song to song. Here are some of the possibilities. We are going to worship. We had to get up early and go through a magnetron. There must have been 4,000 people in this big cavernous um, auditorium because it was the largest place they could host that many people. Mm -hmm. And they didn't even give us a stage. Um, his mother's United Methodist church choir took the center stage and they put us on the floor. Yeah. 
with an upright piano, not even a keyboard. But you know what? I grew up playing. You can't believe some of the atrocious pianos I've played. And I was like, this is no different than what I've ever had to do for every community event. Exactly. I, I know how to play really rotten pianos. <laughs> <laughs> That's a skill. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. When you just you're like, okay, God, and uh, so I, I can't, I cannot tell you my amazement when probably no more than ten feet away from me walked in Barbara Streisand and oh, sat man. down in the front row, um, right behind the first family, right there, and she listened. For an hour. Mm. And I thought, I'm singing your heritage and you don't even know I have no right to be here. Mm. And um, then we, we, we sang the song and I felt the Holy Ghost so strongly. So I just stood to my feet and threw my hands in the air. And we finished. I finished at the top of my lungs. We are standing in his presence on holy ground and sat down to an absolutely thunderous silence. And probably five seconds later, there was one voice in the dark. Oh my God. Hmm. And to me, I mean, it was like, if somebody hadn't said something, I think there had been an earthquake. It was like the heavens opened up and the presence and the power of the Lord swept into the room. And I thought, 4,000 people from around the world, one touch, mm -hmm. one touch. So, wow. To wash his feet publicly, to love him for his grace, his goodness, wow to be a channel of that to somebody who probably will never darken the door. What an honor. Yeah. What an honor. That's amazing. I, I think that's been the sum total of what my life is. So if you want to call that ministry, I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Um, I'm not a credentialed minister. I'm not licensed. Um, I just say I'm a witness. Mm. I testify about what God has done for me. It's yeah. very personal. He's opened his heart to me and he knows I'm not confidential because I tell everything he's ever told me. So. <laughs> <laughs> if he tells me something good, I am definitely going to tell it. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. Now, did, did all of this occur before you wrote Alabaster Box or what, what year did you write that? I wrote Alabaster Box in 1990, actually. Okay. Um, at right, it, it was 90, 90 or 91, and it was during the time when the Clintons were in our life. And uh, actually, um, he has a wonderful and lovely, very talented friend who was a, a high school friend. And he's, he was very loyal to his circle of friends that were with him in Hot Springs. And she is the one who heard me sing for Ray Charles. And she's the one who said, if you want to get someone, you know, from the Pentecostal movement to sing these songs for your inauguration, you need to get this girl rather than bring someone from outside. Well, that was a God mm. thing because there are, I have always felt humbled. I felt like that I am the least as far as I think there's so many singers and musicians 10,000 times better than I am. It's just that the Lord kept opening doors for me and mm. I did not seek it. I, I, it, it just opened. And so she was the one who called up and said, would you, you know, governor Clinton. And he had actually met us before. This is what's funny when he was the attorney general, he had come to Lone Oak and we, we actually met them uh, before he was ever governor. So, you know, God, when you, you, you have to live long enough to see how God has ordered your steps. You need to live long enough and go through enough that you turn around and go, wow, 
Mm, I see how so it true. all fits. It yeah. looked random, wasn't random at all. Mm. I was moving somewhere all this time. And it was powerful. And, and the alabaster box came about because my father-in-law went back to St. Paul to preach. Um, he was receiving his four-year degree. And um, Brother Norris, who was still alive at that time, invited him to speak on a Sunday morning. And they had a very lengthy song service. And he wanted me to either sing before him or after. And and I said, well, you know, I, I think people are sung out right now. I think maybe just you need to preach and then I'll I'll follow you up. I'll do I'll do your altar call. And never knowing, I mean, I listened. Um, I listened to him preach about the woman with the alabaster box. He, he actually spoke on the three instances where women, whether the same, two different, uh, I, I, you know, there's debate, scholarly debate. The point was that she was unashamed to make herself vulnerable in the presence of people who were not feeling what she was feeling, mm. who had absolutely no compunction to be so demonstrative that got me immediately because I felt an affinity with that testimony because I always felt like I had more to give than was necessarily, um, what do I want to say? I guess when you're desperate for God and you want God just going through the motions, just is not acceptable. I was just so hungry. And so my worship tended to be demonstrative before that was accepted. Let me say it like that. Because I needed God so desperately. And so when I saw how she was rejected, because, you know, the same people can sit on the same pew. One of them is absolutely... Um, hanging on to every word, every word. And the other is like, when's it going to be over? You know, yeah. you, you bring, you bring your context to the service. Mm. And so I identified with her and as he began to, I was so moved. I was like, this is me. And I was so utterly moved by what he was preaching. And I was thinking flipping through uh, the Rolodex of my mind, what song will bring this home? Because so many songs can destroy a sermon. <laughs> it makes or break it, it breaks it, whatever yeah. you choose. So I was like, oh Lord. And I was like, I have nothing. So I just got a piece of paper. It seems like it was a tithing envelope. I opened it up and I just started writing in pencil. And then I got up and went to the piano and I just made up the melody wow. on the fly right there. Mm -hmm. Cause it was so, I was so moved. And, um, that was the first time I sang it. And then I went home and I think I tightened up some of the lyrics and I formed up the melody line and I was teaching a Bible study to the president's friend at that time when he was governor and I sang it for, her. and, um, during the Bible study, not that particular time, but for the time that we studied together and I talked to her about that, she got the Holy ghost at her house and, and then our paths diverged and she went on her way and she was raised Southern Baptist. Um, and, um, I, th I, I, I was trying to remember if her father was a Southern Baptist pastor, but, um, she sang as a cantor in a Jewish synagogue and she was so talented and so, um, but I, you know, our paths crossed the Lord filled her with the Holy ghost. And then she went and, and went to seminary, uh, and became licensed as a United Methodist minister, but she got the Holy ghost. Mm. I was there when she got it. And, um, I, I, again, the worship has always been the center. I love you, Jesus. I want to know you. Mm. Use me how you want. 
and, and since I was a child, he has occupied my thoughts. Probably not even a drop in the bucket to the extent to which I've occupied his and everyone who's curious about him. I have never lost my desire to know more of him. That has informed basically everything I've ever done. Yes. It's liberating because I didn't have to prove anything to anybody. At the mm. end of the day, no matter what happened, I was still going to go home with the one who brought me. Wow. So, that's, that's good. Yeah. And so uh, I guess from your perspective, that should be the beginning point. If, if someone is is wanting to be involved in ministry or is, is looking in that direction, that should be the beginning point is having a heart well, of worship. A love, a love I guess, for God. yeah, ministry is service. My service mm-hmm. was created out of a talent the Lord gave me to, to play and sing and doors opened because of what I could do. I had a skill set, you know, such as it was, I was young, um, but I made it available. I gave it to God and God gave it back to me in so many, so many different ways. I, I can't tell you, brother Greg, I had always, it just in the back of my mind thought it would be so cool to be a DJ. Well, who knew who made that possible? I did not go look and I did not apply, but I was like, you, you love me, don't you? Mm, <laughs> You're reading yeah. my mind, aren't you? <laughs> and, and so many other experiences that are just private between the Lord and me. He, I, I can't even begin to tell you what he say. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So for me, ministry is not being the sage on the stage. It's, it's serving where you can because you love. So I really feel like I've been privileged. I, I came to the clinic of the great physician because I was desperate for help and healing. I have my own personal testimony. And he healed me and I stayed. And now I, I register other patients for him. That's what I look at it as. I, I'm working at the clinic where I got my deliverance. And um, I think I think some children, I, I think the Lord calls everybody, but, but I think not everybody chooses to answer. Hmm. I, I thought many times when I was a child that I was just so desperate for God to pick me. And I felt that way. Like I just went after him uh, like a kid trying to get a teacher's attention in elementary school. That's what it felt like to me. I never knew, never knew until I was well into adulthood that really he was pursuing me, not the other way around. Hmm. That revolutionized my thinking. Yeah. And so we have continued this relationship of, of who's pursuing whom, you know, Hmm. So here I am 64 now. I remember four, 60 years of being in his presence, of watching, observing, learning, loving, recognizing him as the source of everything, the center of all things. He's the only factor in my life that makes everything else make sense. Mm. I'm not likely to let go of that for anywhere or anything. I I like what you said there about, um, well, and it's sort of like, this, the story of your life is that um, whatever you have, you give it to him. And it kind of, uh, it's kind of encapsulated in that song as well, the alabaster box. But, yeah. um, you know, the talent or the gifting that, that you have, because, you know, you, you don't fit in a box. You know, your ministry doesn't fit in a box. How you're used by God doesn't fit in a box. But you placed what he had given you, you placed it back into his hand, and then he, he used it however he saw fit. Because yes. you... you and, and that can speak to people in so many different areas and in, in different walks of life. It doesn't have to be at a pulpit. It doesn't have to be on a platform at church. You know, if you place that talent and the ability that he has given you back into his hands, you have no idea how he can use it. 
I I, I think a lot of times, Brother Greg, that people are searching for significance and they equate a position with being significant. Mm -hmm. And so they pursue a position because they are desperate to feel esteem. When in reality, there can be no greater esteem than when God starts pulling on you to come find him. And he's, and he does this in secret. He does not do it openly. He, he does it in the dark. He, he, he does it when you're by yourself in the car and the tears are rolling down your cheeks and you're trying to figure out what you're going to do with your life. And he, and he does it when you feel like you've been forgotten. I mean, when you look at Moses, a man who was obviously skilled in the politics of Egypt, he had to be multilingual. Nobody knows how many languages he spoke. He was intelligent. He was schooled. He was, in spite of whatever um, communication affliction he felt like he had, oh my word, his perspective. You talk about a worldview, Mm -hmm. the world power at the time, really. And then look where he, he was sent. Um, it wasn't his public education that made the man. Mm. It was a private one in the wilderness. And, and at some point, you know, God will use kings, potentates. Being used does not mean being anointed. That's, mm. They're not the same thing. God can use all kinds of people for his own purpose. And I mean that in the most brutal sense. You know, you, whether you want to be used or not, a. Hey. but when God chooses you because of a relationship, now that is different. And that's what I'm in pursuit of because positions come and go. And I've discovered there's... Um, in in the palaces of power, there's a lot of cutthroat. It's very cold. It's not warm and inviting. There's so much. It's Machiavellian, but not with Jesus. At the end of the day, he loves you just as much. And you do what you do unto him. And he's not critical and he's not demanding. And he's not, I mean, I... If he wanted excellence, Brother Greg, I mean, I cannot compete with angels. And again, I'm telling you, there are musicians among us that are, I am just in awe at their ability to sing and to play. It's just astonishing. Well, clearly, he wasn't looking for that with me because I have a limited skill set. So he must have been looking for something else. Mm -hmm. He saved me. He delivered me. I know what he did for me. I I owe him everything Mm. for the rest of my life. I owe him everything Mm. every day. And I cannot wait to see him. I want to see him. He's never gotten older and I'm sure he's counting. He's had to do some (laughs) readjust the count. And it's amazing to be 64. I cannot believe it because in my mind's eye, I can still see the four year old, but Mm. now I'm a grandmother and, you know, I have a perspective. I I want to see him, this figure, that's this shadow that's been in my life all my life. I am good and hooked. <laughs> well, it, it was interesting, the, the story you mentioned there of Moses, how uh, I love what how you said that his private education um, was far more important than his public. And, and I completely agree. And obviously, it was the private education he had alone in the wilderness that led him and allowed him to to lead. But also, that public education would have helped as well. You know, with yes. um, when it came to form forming uh, the nation of Israel and helping lead them through. You know, he had that amazing public education in the palace, and and it seems like as well in your story, it's it's similar. You know, you have that. You have that private education. You have that times of worship and moments in the presence of the Lord. But you also have that talent you develop through music and also uh, your education when it comes to uh, teaching. Yes. And you've actually got a doctorate in, in education. And- right. And I do want to say this. You know, I was uneducated. I was filled with passion. 
wanted to serve God, but I mean, I never saw myself going to school, getting multiple degrees, getting a job, you know, blessing my family with health benefits from working. But had I not done all of that, I would have never gone the places I went. Never. Mm. Um, so you're right. You cannot minimize. I mean, my father would always quote the scripture to me. A man's gift will make room before him, uh, will make room for him and bring him before kings. Meaning, you know, uh, it was kind of uh, an ancillary to Janice, God will fill an empty heart, but he won't fill an empty head. You have to do some work. And so yeah. I had to humble myself and take instruction from people who didn't even claim to know God, who didn't want to know God. But I had to learn some skills or else I was meaningless. All, all passion and no training didn't work. So yeah. I had to go through the humility and the humbling experience of being in the hands of people who could teach me things that I needed to do in order to do my job skill well, in order to understand how to maintain attention in an audience, how to calibrate, how long, when to stop, when is enough, how to give people. I think one of the most powerful things the Lord taught me was it doesn't matter whether people have a thimble or a barrel. Each feels satisfied if they're full. Mm. And you have to be able to pour a thimble and honor the person who only has a thimble and give them exactly what they ask for so that they too go home being satisfied rather than feeling reproached because they can't hold more. Mm. I don't know if that makes sense to no, you. No, that but. does. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It it doesn't do you a bit of good to have a hundred dollar bill at a vending machine unless you can break it down into small change. Yeah, exactly. And the Lord had to teach me small change. Yeah. 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 I mean, and it so, makes complete sense. It's like if you're teaching a Bible study, you're not going to go into a, a basic Bible study. You're not going going to go into the depths of uh, of you know the spirit world and that sort of thing because all they've got is is room for a thimble. They don't they don't have that right that capacity. And the, that's exactly right. And Paul said it well, I become all things to all men that by any means I might win some. I feel like if people just knew Jesus, if they knew the Jesus that has known me and whom I have known, they too would throw themselves at his feet in the clinic and then say, what can I do to help you reach others just like me? Mm. Honestly. But again, all that passion belongs to him. All that discipline belongs to other people because he, he can handle anything I can throw at him. If I need to pray hours, if I want to sing hours, if I want to talk hours, if I want to just be in his presence hours, but most people can't take that. So we have to be willing to, to give them what they ask for rather than what we want them to have. I have learned so much in his presence. Jesus mm. was always a gentleman and, and he never, um, he never overwhelmed people. He just met their needs. Yeah, yeah he met true. their needs. I love him. <laughs> mm, that's so good. Yeah, and and I've I've noticed I, I recognize that this last time that we were together, I think it was in August when you were ministering, and, and I've always noticed it whenever you do minister is that you are able to keep people's attention, whether you're telling a story, whether you're expounding on the Word of God, you're able to keep that attention, but then also bring it home with, with the anointing, with, with the, the presence of God that is quite unique to your ministry. And, um, but you have both sides, as you said, you know, is that there's that skill in keeping people's attention and putting together thoughts and being able to convey that to people, which you've learned over the years. But then there's the other aspect that can only be found in, in being in the presence of God. Right. And I, I think, I think what's encouraging to me is you're asking these questions and making these observations. Clearly, my life may be punctuated by some unusual events, maybe, maybe unique in the details, but certainly not in the pattern. Oh, the Lord is looking for young people who will push aside all the distractions 
and slip away and go find him just because they love him, share their lives with him. I was amazed that the scripture came to me. Uh, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man, any man, hears my voice. He, he, he didn't qualify that. He didn't say, if you're an educated man, if you're a woman, if you're, you belong to this culture. He said, if you hear me and you open the door, I'm on one side and you're on the other. I'd like to engage with you. And then what's so powerful about that, he said, I'll come in and you can eat with me and I'll eat with you. And I thought about how I love sitting down with people over a good meal, uh, maybe a cup of tea, um, some dessert. I, I love the engagement because it's relational. Mm. And of all of the things he said to every single church, only one did he say, I would sure love to spend some time in fellowship with you. Mm. That's very moving to me. Very moving. We're gadget rich and relationship poor. And, and sometimes I think the longing that we feel is God transposing his longing into us. Maybe what we're feeling is God saying, I surely do miss you. I wish you'd talk to me. I'm lonely for the sound of your voice. I'm lonely for your presence. I'm not saying you shouldn't hone your skill, but at the end of the day, who does all that belong to? And then when you pour that out in the presence of God, skillfully done, doing everything you know to do, somebody who doesn't know him will see that golden flow through your heart and hands to his. And that's his glory. And when people see that, it changes them. Mm. And they also feel a call and they'll have to choose what to do with it. I, I just think there's nothing like it. And um, I think what whatever your service to the Lord is, when you do it as unto him, he cherishes it. And that's where the reward is. Yeah. He cherishes it. Uh, people will be disappointed uh, with me because this question uh, typically means that we're beginning to wrap up and uh, this has been an amazing conversation. I like to ask this to everyone who comes on the podcast uh, just to get a gauge, but what is it that drives you when it comes to ministry, when it comes to your walk with God? Hunger. Mm. I'm so hungry. I'm so pulled between my present circumstance and my future expectation. I, I will never be satisfied with, I mean, I'm living my life, Brother Greg, but I know I'm mortal. And I've always heard the sound of the clock, always. And I can't stop it, but I'm in pursuit. I, I want, I, where I'm living right now is that scripture that says, Call to me and I will answer and show you great and mighty things that you don't know. Mm. And I'm, I'm there. Mm. I'm, I'm running again. I'm in pursuit. I'm, I want to know more. I want to know. I want to be fully transformed by the time my time is up. I do not want to be a halfling. I want to be the creature he spoke of. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. That's what I want. I want to, I want to reach the destination, the point, the, the point where the scripture says, the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Um, I want more of Jesus. That's good. Oh, I, I've thoroughly enjoyed this conversation with you. And, and, and again, so grateful that you have provided your time this evening uh, to, to come on the podcast and to, and to talk to the audience. And uh, I'm sure they're very grateful to have spent this time with you. 
as we finish up here, I want to give you the final word, whatever you feel to share uh, to the listeners of this podcast. Thank you again. This is Joe Shan for your, your time today. My, my pleasure, Brother Greg. I'm humbled and honored um, to share my heart, my love for Jesus, some of the stories of my past life. And I want to say this, the things that people find most intriguing about me happened in my 30s. That was 30 years ago. I don't live there. I, I don't live in that past. Jesus is just as real and precious to me. He's still doing things for me. They may not be quite as flashy as some of those earlier events where my life intersected with historical facts, but they are more powerful because as the players on that stage have receded from my life, the one figure... That began it all, still remains. So I'm curious now, what will he do with the rest of my life? I'm homeschooling two grandchildren. I've another little granddaughter on the way. And um, he said, I know the thoughts I have to you, thoughts of peace, of good and not evil, to give you an expected end. I'm still intrigued by him. And I guess I would say to anybody, anybody who feels a longing for more, don't try to subject that to cultural norms and expectations. You go for it. You do your best in school. You do your best on your job. You be exemplary in your behavior, in the effort and time you spend. Never let it be said that you were a shirker or that you neglected to do what was required of you, you do it with all your might and you give it as a gift to the one, the audience of one that is observing what you're doing from the heart, you will catch his eye. And I think that's what it's all about, to catch his eye and hold it. He's looking for people like that. He's looking for people like you. You're the one he's looking for. And if anything I've said will compel you to lay aside distractions and excuses and obsessions and obstacles and get over, get over and come up, the view at the top of that experience is expansive and so much will make sense to you and you will become a worshiper. You can't see those things and not worship him. There's a place for you and you don't have to compete with anybody else. You are your own competition. So if you'll allow me, I'll just say a little prayer for you. I can't see you, but I know you're out there. I can see you in my mind's eye, the searcher, the seeker, discontented, longing and looking. I'm talking straight to you. May the Lord guide your steps as he has guided mine. May he speak to you in the night, the day, and all points in between. May he assure you that you have his affection, his heart, and that he has only the best in store for you. May God grant you the desires of your heart. May you find that his kingdom far surpasses anything that you ever dreamed possible for yourself. And at the end of the day, whether it is the end of the last day of your life, for the end of the first day going into the second. May you come to the same realization that you began with Alpha and you will end with Omega. And the gift of God is that you have a complete and full and satisfied life until you are finally transformed into his glorious image. I look forward to seeing you at that moment in that transformation until then we'll worship together.